stem cells 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 amazingly important cells unbelievable breakthroughs the transplant breakthrough a promising medical breakthrough regenerative medicine a frankenstein fantasy Imagine a world where any injured or diseased organ or body part you have is simply replaced by a new artificial one literally man-made in the lab just for you. The allure of this idea was exploited for fame and money by one of the worst charlatans in the history of medicine, Paolo Macchiarini. Once considered to be a pioneer in regenerative medicine, Macchiarini turned out to be a pathological liar and a con man who performed botched surgeries on 20-plus patients. Macchiarini's infamous procedure was the transplant of the windpipe also called the trachea, first using tracheas from deceased human donors, and later plastic prosthetics. He never did any animal studies, lied to both his patients and funding institutions about the success of the operations, and falsified data in papers published in medical journals. Despite all this, he received continued support for over six years from one of the most prestigious institutions in the world, the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, whose Nobel Assembly awards the Nobel Prize in Medicine. Macchiarini's con was covered in several documentaries, most recently by Netflix in Bad Surgeon, which is a solid watch, but glances over many details as it's more focused on Macchiarini's love scam of NBC journalist Benita Alexander. Oh yeah, besides being a literal criminal, he ran several romance scams with at least two women, and one of them was also the mother of a dead patient that he operated on. After watching the documentary, I was left with so many questions. Why did the surgery, the trachea transplant, fail? How did Macchiarini get away with bogus science for so long? So I fell down a deep rabbit hole looking for answers, and what I found is... Well, let's just say the Netflix documentary barely even scratched the surface of this story. Before we get into the nitty-gritty of it, I would like to know how Macchiarini became this famous miracle doctor in the eyes of the public. And to understand that, we have to go over all of his infamous trachea surgeries. So, Macchiarini's rise to medical stardom begins in 2008, when he performed his first trachea transplant on Claudia Castillo. In his early operations, Macchiarini didn't use plastic, but trachea from a deceased human donor. He'd take the donor trachea, remove all of its donor cells using detergent, and then seed it with stem cells from the patient's bone marrow in a bioreactor. Now, seeding with stem cells in a bioreactor may sound really fancy, but the trachea was really just rotated in a plastic box with the bone marrow cells of the patient. The idea was that the stem cells would regenerate cartilage, blood vessels, and the mucus lining of the trachea. The scientific principle behind this mechanism is called wishful thinking and magic, as there never was and there still isn't any evidence that this is possible. Together with another dubious character, British doctor Martin Birchall, Macchiarini decided not to do any animal studies and attached the artificial trachea to Claudia Castillo's airway. Just three months after the surgery, Birchall and Macchiarini published a now retracted paper in The Lancet, claiming that the patient had a stable airway and no complications. In reality, Claudia Castillo had to have a metal stent placed inside the trachea to hold it open. She struggled with breathing and infections and ultimately had her left lung removed in 2016. She's reportedly still alive today, but not thanks to Macchiarini's surgery. Selling the surgery on Claudia Castillo as a success painted Macchiarini as a pioneering doctor in the media and helped him advance his career. He went on to perform more botched surgeries with donor tracheas on eight more patients. Besides Claudia Castillo, only one of them, Kieran Lynch, is still alive today. 
In 2010, Macchiarini got hired by the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, where he started using a plastic tube instead of donor trachea. His next surgery was on Andemarium Bayen, a PhD student diagnosed with tracheal cancer that obstructed his airways. Bayen was the first to receive the plastic trachea. And this is how Macchiarini described the procedure in a video posted by the Karolinska Institute on their website. Um, almost three weeks ago, we transplanted for the first time a windpipe that was made by um, nanotechnology, which is a new technology that provides completely tissue engineered um, scaffolds, synthetic scaffolds, that can be then seeded with the specific cells that this structure needs. I found this infuriating to watch because Macchiarini just drops a lot of buzzwords like nanotechnology and tissue engineered synthetic scaffolds. And what he means is literally a plastic pipe cured in stem cells. It is also devastating to watch how they try to portray Bayen as recovered in the video, when in reality the plastic trachea slowly suffocated him and he passed away two and a half years later. In the next three years, seven more people received the plastic trachea from Macchiarini. Only one of them, Dimitri Onogda, is still confirmed to be alive today, and only because the plastic trachea was removed after six months when it started to collapse, and today he lives with a tracheostomy, which is basically an airway opening in the neck. The most despicable part of this scandal is that Macchiarini and all of the doctors who stood behind him knew that the synthetic trachea was never going to work. To understand why, we need to talk about the surgery. So maybe using plastic to replace a body part sounds crazy, but it isn't that uncommon in medicine. Plastic is used in dental fillings, joint replacements like knee or hip replacements, and to repair blood vessels. So why can't we use a plastic pipe to replace the trachea? Well, there are several major problems with doing this, all boiling down to basic biology. I am not a doctor or an expert in this, but honestly, Honestly, you don't need to be to understand why this procedure was doomed from the start. First, the trachea, despite being called the windpipe, is not just a pipe but an organ. It doesn't just move air to the lungs, but acts as the first line of defense from harmful particles and bacteria in the air. The inner lining of the trachea is covered in tiny hairs called cilia, which trap dust and microorganisms before they can reach the lungs. Macchiarini's idea was that putting bone marrow extract, also known as stem cells, on a plastic tube would allow tissue to magically grow back and and restore the trachea. There is no scientific evidence to support the idea that stem cells can regenerate all the complex structures like cartilage, blood vessels, and the cilia that make up the trachea. Problem number two is healing. Because the trachea is constantly exposed to bacteria from the air, it is difficult for tissue to grow into or around the plastic pipe. Ultimately, the sutures holding the plastic pipe in place will come loose, the trachea will collapse and lead to death through suffocating or infection. Even Macchiarini's first surgeries, where he used donor trachea, were never going to work. In any organ transplantation, restoring blood supply to the organ is crucial for a successful surgery. If an organ isn't connected to blood vessels, it won't receive oxygen and vital nutrients, which will lead to necrosis or tissue death. Restoring blood supply to the trachea is extremely difficult because the blood vessels are tiny and need to be reconnected between the cartilage rings. So it's a very complicated surgery. How did Macchiarini solve this obvious issue? The answer is of course stem cells, which will again magically turn into blood vessels and reconnect the trachea to the blood supply. All of this information on why synthetic tracheas never could have worked was published in a critical review in 2002, so six years before Macchiarini's first trachea transplant. 
important. So even if Macchiarini slept through the introductory biology and anatomy class in college, he still could have done a simple Google search to see if his highly experimental surgery had been studied before. So how did Macchiarini get away with such blatant deception for years, continuing to receive funding while selling snake oil to his patients and superiors? The first reason is the hype around regenerative medicine and stem cells. Especially in the early 2000s, stem cells were talked about in the media as having supernatural potential. The news were flooded with poorly written articles by journalists with no critical thinking skills and no understanding of the science. But bad journalism wasn't the only thing that enabled Macchiarini's misconduct. It was also the dollar dollar bills y'all. Government dollar bills. In 2008, the Swedish government picked out a few research areas that could get long-term funding on an enormous scale. Regenerative medicine was one of these fields. So based on this new government policy, the Karolinska Institute applied for and received a large five-year grant for regenerative medicine. If Karolinska produced promising results during these five years, they could get long-term funding from the government for this kind of research. At that time, Macchiarini had several bogus papers published in The Lancet and was celebrated in the news as a stem cell pioneer. So in 2010, Karolinska hired him as a guest professor and lead surgeon. There is a lot that played behind the scenes of their hiring decision. Macchiarini Macchiarini had contacts that likely helped him get the job, but I think that the main reason why he got hired at this prestigious institution was the compounding effect of so many mistakes on so many levels. The fraudulent papers he published in The Lancet, the media frenzy, all of Macchiarini's equally unethical collaborators who supported him, and Karolinska wanting to get that grant money at all cost. Institutional cover-up culture also worked in Macchiarini's favor. After the first three plastic trachea replacements at Karolinska, the management of the Karolinska Institute became aware of their mistake and didn't allow further surgeries to be performed at the hospital. But Karolinska still continued to employ Macchiarini. Even when Karolinska received a complaint detailing Macchiarini's misconduct from four whistleblowers, the Institute didn't take responsibility for what happened. It was obvious that if Macchiarini went down, several high-ranking people who protected him and hired him would go down with him. And some of them, like uh, Vice Chancellor Anders Homsten and Vice Chancellor Harriet Wahlberg, eventually had to resign when a documentary about the misconduct, titled The Experiments by Bose Lindquist, came out and infuriated the Swedish public. So where is Macchiarini today? In June of 2023, he got sentenced in Sweden to two and a half years for gross assault and is expected to begin his sentence soon. If you want to get more details on this scandal, I recommend reading Leonid Schneider's blog, For Better Science, where he also extensively covers not just Macchiarini, but all of the people who enabled him. You can also have a look at Dr. Pierre Delaire's book, The Biggest Lie in Medical History. All of the links are in the description. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the Macchiarini saga in the comments. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.